Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks and praise for this day. We have entered into these courts, this place, with thanksgiving and praise. Thank you, Lord, for the day. Thank you, Lord, for the beginning of a new week. Thank you, Lord, for the message that you will give to us today from Luke chapter 17. We pray, O oh Lord, that it would touch our hearts. And uh, again, we ask that we might be doers of the word and not hearers only. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 17 is where we are. And he, meaning Jesus, said to his disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Well, now these two verses are a bit difficult to understand. I mean, the words we can understand them, but we don't have a context. So how do you hang it on anything if you don't have a context? And so, you know, it just appears that these verses, these words of Jesus just appeared out of nowhere. So why did he bring that up now? You know, we want to know the why behind why he said that. And we just don't know. Anyway. What Jesus is saying is true. Offenses are going to come into our lives as we live them. What Jesus tells us clearly is that the offenses should not be coming through his followers. Let me say that again. Offenses are sure to come in life, but they should not be coming through Jesus' followers. Regardless of the person through whom the offense comes, Jesus' word to that person is woe. Woe to the person through whom those offenses come. Surely we've got to understand why. Why, um, why followers of Jesus shouldn't be the offending persons and why they would receive a woe. You see, we're not supposed to cause offenses to people because we represent Christ. Another way to look at that word represent is, is put the R-E dash present. We re-present him before people. You know, when people see us, we are, they're supposed to be seeing Christ in us and through us. So when we are offending people, they're not going to see Christ. So we need to represent him. We need to represent him. And we need to represent him in the best light possible, whenever possible. The eternal welfare of people is always at stake. If we cause offense, our offense may cause people to turn the other way and leave Jesus. And we don't want to be a party to that. You know, so far... We've heard that in general, offenses are going to come. However, is Jesus speaking of people in general, or is he speaking about a group of people? Uh, the Greek word here translated as little ones is mikron. That kind of reminds me of the word micro, mikron. Uh, it means small ones. So we ask, who are the small ones that he's talking about when he says it's better that a millstone be tied around a part, the part, the offending person's neck, and he'd be thrown into the depths of a sea. So who are the little ones? Who are the small ones? Well, it could mean a little child or someone new to the faith. Those little ones. In Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 18, Jesus was speaking of a little child. But we don't have that particular context here. So it could, of course, the little microns could be children, little children, or it could mean somebody new to the faith. We just don't know. We've got to mind our P's and our Q's when we are around Jesus, uh, children and those new to the faith. We don't want to do anything that might offend them. And 
particular, we don't want to do anything that might offend them spiritually. If we do, the word is woe. It's better for a millstone to be hung around the offender's neck and they be cast into the sea than that he should offend the little ones. Now Jesus' words here, they're hard to hear. Nevertheless, we've got to hear it because we've got to guard our our, our mouths. I remember a mem. I think it was before them. They were mems. Before the mems became mems on the internet. Because this is prior to the internet. I think it was probably on a greeting card. It says, Lord, put your arm around my shoulders and your hand over my mouth. <laughs> We've got to guard our lips. Anyway, and then Jesus switches gears again, it seems. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Well, a person sinning against you is bringing offense, right? He might be bringing up that, that line of thinking here. But he says, take heed to yourselves. If your brother, now I'm sure this could mean your biological brother, but he, it could also mean the brother in Christ, or sister in Christ, okay? If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Now this is a very clear word from our Lord. You know, in verses 1 and 2, he warns us not to offend the little ones. Now he's telling us not to hold on to the sins or hold on to the offenses our brother commits against us. We first rebuke the offending brother, and I would hope that whatever rebuke we have for our offending brother, it would be done in love. Be done gently. Okay? I also would hope that it would be done in private. Now there is a caveat to that, that if the offense is public, then the rebuke could be public. To let everybody hear that exchange but then it would also be wonderful if the uh, statement by the offending party is also public to say, I repent. Okay? It doesn't always work out that way. The rebuke is to let the brother or the sister know what he or she has done. It's never to bring harm to them. Hopefully the offending brother will accept the rebuke and what is done and repent of the sin. And if the brother or the sister repents, then we are to forgive them. Jesus goes on to say that if our brother or our sister sins against us seven times in a day, and we must also conclude that we rebuke them seven times in a day, and repent seven times in a day, then we are to forgive him seven times. Now, all of us might be thinking that this particular brother has a serious problem if he keeps doing the same thing over and over again, you know, leading us to have to rebuke him over and over again and leading us, hopefully leading them to repent over and over again and us to forgive over and over again. And, of course, I would say he does, or she does. But what's Jesus getting out here? Here. Jesus is teaching us that we're to forgive as our Heavenly Father forgives us. Surely our sins against God each day number far more than seven. Okay? And God forgives us every time we repent of the sins we commit. Even we, when we commit the same sin over and over and over again. So we've got to keep this in mind when our brothers or our sisters sin against us. The magnitude of what Jesus is saying here, and I, this is kind of funny. The magnitude of what Jesus has said here, 
And the apparent uh, human impossibility of it is it isn't lost on the disciples. And so what do they say? Lord, increase our faith. Help! The disciples think that they need to have far more faith than they presently have in order to do what Jesus just told them to do. Jesus doesn't buy the excuse. In verse 6, he said, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Well, mustard size, mustard seed size faith can pull up and replant a mulberry tree. What's Jesus saying here? Well, he, he could be letting the disciples know in us that even the smallest of faith can accomplish great things. However, I don't think that's what he's talking about here. He brings it up because they asked for more faith. They want more faith, and he says, hey, if you just have a faith, a little, little faith, it can do this. But I think there's something entirely different going on. Because let's hear what he says the next time. He says, in the next verses, he says, and which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him, when he, comes, when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat. But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise, when you have done all the things which you are commanded, say... We are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. What's the point of these words? Which follow on the heels of Jesus talking about mustard-sized seed faith. Here, here is what I believe Jesus is saying. You know, upon hearing, they would have to forgive their brother over and over again if they've sinned against them and you know, they've been sinned against. And if the, they rebuke the brother, and if the brother repents, and so forth, over and over again, they have asked Jesus for faith. But Jesus is telling them they do not need increased faith. Because if they had faith the size of a mustard seed, it could do this. What they need, however, is to stop whining and asking for more faith. They simply need to do what Jesus just told them to do in the story. They ask for more faith to do what is commanded to do. A person doesn't need more faith to do what's commanded to do. They just need to do what's commanded of them to do. Do you get it? You don't need more faith to do that. You just need to do it. You know, you don't have faith. If it's commanded, you do it. I think that's what Jesus is trying to tell them. They want more faith. He says, just do what you know is right to do. I've never seen that in the text before. That's something God showed me this week. I'm like, oh yeah. That's what he's talking about. Of course, there could be other things in the text too, but that's what he showed me this week. It's like, they ask for faith. You don't need faith to do what God tells you to do. You just need to be obedient. That's all you need. Verse 11. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priest. priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? 
And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. This is a story we're pretty familiar with. You know, his, Jesus' authority and power to heal. You know, the lepers, leprosy was a bad, bad thing for anybody to contract. You know, anybody who had leprosy had to stand at a distance and say, unclean, unclean, so that people could walk around them. It wasn't social distancing. They had to do it. Yes, for social reasons, but it was commanded in God's word that that is what they were supposed to do. Here it was their cry for mercy. They had been ostracized from their families, their friends, their communities because of the leprosy. It was a terrible life to live. It was a terrible disease to have. Jesus hears their cry, and the text says that when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priest. The text doesn't say that Jesus wanted them to touch them or anything. He just said, Go. Now, this is what I imagine Jesus doing, okay? They're standing at a distance saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us, okay? They're yelling, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us, all right? And it's like Carolyn over there yelling at me. She's a good distance away. Now, in a quiet space, I could hear her. But if she was in a, a noisier environment, that's a different story. But I can tell, I could see Jesus yelling back at her, Go show yourself to the priests! And they turn and go. Alright? The, the exchange was just, Hey, this is what he, you know, this is what he does. Okay? Why the priests? Why show yourself to the priests? Well, they were the ones within Israel who could declare a person clean. Clean of any kind of skin disease. So off they went believing that the priest would declare them cleansed. It was as they went that they were healed of leprosy. They didn't have to wait long, okay? And I can imagine their skin like Naaman, the Syrian in the Old Testament, that's 2 Kings 5, he had leprosy. We are told that when he washed in the Jordan River, we are told that after he washed and dipped himself seven times in the river, that he came out and his skin was like that of a little child. Well, we all know what that looks like. We go, oh, look at that beautiful skin. You know, there aren't any wrinkles. <laughs> there aren't any eight spots. There's nothing of that sort, you know. They're just beautiful and soft, you know. So, so I imagine that that's what their skin looked like when they be. So they knew immediately that they were cleansed. And I can just imagine their surprise and their joy. What happened next surprised Jesus. All ten lepers had been cleansed. But only one of them came back to return to Jesus to give him thanks. The text makes it clear that this one was a Samaritan. The others we've got to presume are Jews because Jesus sends them to the priests in Jerusalem. They had to be Jews. Now the Samaritan was going to go as well because the Samaritans had a, you know, they had a, a kind of a, a shirt sleeve relationship with Israel it's just that they had gotten corrupted earlier on. They started intermarrying with people they weren't supposed to intermarry with. So the Jews didn't want to have anything to do with them. So the Jews, the ones who were supposed to have a relationship with God, didn't return. The Samaritan did. A foreigner, a Samaritan, a man with a tiny connection to Israel, came back and returned thanks. And for this, the man received something else. And we may not look at it that way, because Jesus said, he was, he was told that your faith has made you well. In other words, this man was not only cleansed, he was made well. Now we try to think that they're, they're 
they're the same thing. They aren't. You see, we are tripartite people. We are body, mind, and spirit. You can heal the body, but not necessarily affect the mind and the spirit. What happened when Jesus said, you are well, he was talking to the whole person. The nine, they went back, they went to Jerusalem, they were pronounced cleansed. Jesus didn't take the cleansing away from them. But the rest of their whole being wasn't affected. This man who came to return thanks to Jesus and praise God, glorify God, when he returned thanks, he received the pronouncement the full package, yeah, the full package. He was pronounced well. He was pronounced whole. And that's huge. What do we conclude? We conclude from this that giving thanks to God is a big, big deal. <laughs>